I've been in InfoSec for about 25 years. Um, started out with a summer internship job that turned into a part-time that turned into full-time, and that's how I paid through my way through college. And uh, somehow along the way, I've been involved in defense industry, uh, financial industry, uh, was in an ISP during the dot boom, and um, it's been an interesting ride. I've learned along the way quite a few ways not to do stuff, and so I'm going to try to help today to pass along a few, maybe what's better, uh, in terms of presenting to executive uh, level. Uh, when you're presenting metrics, when you're presenting ideas, you're trying to win something. This is actually a lot harder than it seems, and if you've done it, um, you found that out probably the hard way, just as I have. So um, I'll roll into this. Just to make sure this is what you thought it was, so you can go find another one if you want to first. We're going to try to cover a few things. First thing is I'm going to really pound on the idea of avoiding meaningless metrics, because that's a real easy trap to fall into. And I'm going to show you stuff that you think is meaningful isn't, and, and that will start to uh, tune yourself to be able to avoid that trap. We'll talk through finding some better metrics. I'm going to offer some samples. I'm not saying they're the only ones or the best ones are just examples, but they're kind of crafted also to let us dig through the layers of, of what works and what doesn't in terms of presenting the metrics, because it's more about the communication than the numbers. And, and that leads into kind of the last piece, which is ultimately what we're trying to do is improve communication and drive some action. If we're going to talk to executives, there's got to be an agenda that we have and we want to drive something, and so we've got to make that happen. And communication, I, the best quote I've ever heard about it is, communication is what happens on the receiver end. If it hasn't happened on the receiver end, it didn't happen. You didn't communicate. And, and it's hard to swallow that, but that's the reality. So as I go through today, um, hopefully I communicate and share some stuff with you. I'd like you to, to ask questions or share your ideas back. Again, this is not like I've done a million years of research on it. I've just kind of presented in different forums, learned some mistakes, people have critiqued, and uh, in the process, I think I've got a few nuggets to pass to you today. So with that, let's dig into it, presenting executive uh, to executives metrics. First of all, if you're looking for this, that's the red track or something that's not this session, so you'll have to go find it. Um, not a problem. Um, I'd hate to, to admit this, but here it is. I have in, in my own company seen this in the last couple of months. Here we go. Please don't do this. Let, let's just take a look. The person who does this actually thinks this is the most brilliant thing ever. And, and let's walk down. Billions of blocked packets to a board member. This is what this, a, a graphic very, very similar to this was presented. Billions of events. And when's the cocktail hour? I mean, we've lost the executives right there. And they proceeded to try to say how very important and impactful the slide was. I guarantee you the board members now decided I have no interest in whatever the remaining slides you have to present to me. So go ahead. I'll feign interest, and, and we'll get on. Um, please don't ever do this, because it's meaningless. They'll never make it to the bottom. Whatever the bottom was supposed to communicate, it didn't. Another thing that we'll tend to do is because we like facts, uh, typically, you know, there's a lot of numbers, there's packets, there's analysis, we'll do this. I want you to understand what numbers are. Numbers are things that when they're presented in this fashion for most of your executives, for most of your senior management or boards, will put them to sleep. It will numb them out. So you don't want to do this. The other problem you're going to run into is you'll find that executive who will look at this and get very excited. And they're going to want to debate with you the difference between 584 fish and 614 the next month and what that variance was and how do you know. And honestly, it doesn't mean a thing. So not only will you lose 99% of your audience, but that 1%, they're going to ask you questions you're not ready for and, and, and have nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish. So don't ever present something like this either. Okay. Here's what happens. We like the numbers because that is how we understand the world. Um, we thrive on large amounts of data coming in. 
We'll do the analysis. We understand what the transactions are, what the events are. We'll, we'll dig into, you know, for what the log, where it came from, how that event occurred. But this, these numbers lack context. They don't mean anything to the board members because they, unlike us, don't live and breathe and die by this every day. We do. They're very, very meaningful to the person who sits next to you. When you're trying to troubleshoot something, it's absolutely essential. But they're numbing to the, the leadership because this is not their world. And we have to approach them in their world. What executives, what managers like is what I'm calling numbers. They want tasty little things. Because <clears throat> the information has been contextualized. If you've worked at it hard, you've, you've got good information. You've changed, changed it from data, which is, was discrete points of information, to usable information to make decisions and take actions on. And they're interested in something that's fairly quick. Managers are not supposed to tell you exactly what to do. They're just supposed to provide you guidance. Boards of directors are not going to get into the business of the business. They're going to help figure out are you on the right path or not and get you adjusted. And so we don't want to bring them a puzzle for them to work. They don't want the Rubik's Cube. They want you to put it out in front of them and then say, here's directionally where we need to go, or we're planning to do this, yay, nay. That's what the executives and the boards want from you. You're the expert, so give them that tasty little piece that's been prepared for them, and they'll go ahead and grab it. This is what you want your executives to look like. They are grabbing whatever you put in front of them and having a wonderful little time with it. Okay, And, and it's, it's kind of cute. You say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. But this is, get this in your head, numbers. That's what you're going to deliver your execs. So what does it look like? This is the value proposition to them. It appears they don't have any clue to what's going on. The reality is an executive every day empties their head out completely so they can process the things that are hitting them. They're big, complex questions. They bring in the information. They work it through, and they make a decision to guide something, and they move on. If they keep all these pieces in their heads, think about a CEO. They try to keep everything in their head. They could not possibly do their job. It's not going to work. So part of their practice at the executive level is to empty their head out continually and just focus on exactly what we're talking about right now. So to do that, we have to bring them information. First of all, it's going to be actionable. What do you want me to do with this? You came to me. You got, uh, got some of my time. What do you want? Make sure your numbers are actionable. They're, they're driving towards something. What is that something? Next, it's got to be easy to understand. It's got to be that I can look at it and fairly quickly grasp it. You don't have a two-minute speech. You might have a 30-second speech. If you can give it to them in 10 or 15 seconds, perfect. Again, they're not stupid. They're just very time-constrained. So if you haven't done your homework to be able to get the first thing up there on the screen and give them the taste of it in a very quick window, you haven't prepared for it. But if you have, they'll work with it. I suggest for most circumstances, it be trend focused. Because they're not down in the deep, you are. But you're asking for something directionally. Should we do this? Should we stop doing that? We want to change course. And the story has to be fairly easy to see. You have to kind of get it out of the weeds so they can evaluate it. Now, in all of this, you had better know all the numbers behind the numbers because some of those smart people will ask you tough questions and they'll drill in. And that's great. If they start drilling in, you've got them engaged. Okay, But what you present at the front has to be fairly quick and hit these points. Be brutal on yourself as you're doing it. Okay, So I'm going to start with email. It's a fairly simple example, and I want to kind of have you get your executive hat on. And as we walk through these, think it through so that then you can self-critique when you're starting to prepare whatever your metrics are. What the business cares about with email. It's pretty simple. I want to make sure mail is being delivered to my company. I don't want the spam or the other things that can create problems. I've heard about it, and it's disruptive, and it wastes time. So make sure there's no spam in the email. Like the no part, right? Zero spam. Really easy to achieve. And just give me an idea of what's happening. Is it working? That's what they care about. They don't care about how you did it. 
if you want to put up a really cool diagram of the filtering, the gateway, and, and here's the MX records, they don't care. They really don't. Um, what the external factors are, they may not care why spam is up or down today. You probably will want to have an answer in case they ask, but initially, not an interested thing. Exactly how much? It, does it make a difference when we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of emails in and out of a company in a month if you're off, you know, the number's 26 or 28? No. So don't try to get into that granular sort of presentation of numbers. So here we go. We're going to take a stab at this. Let's present email numbers to our executives. Let's make sure it's successfully delivered. So we're going to talk about what's good. That's success. We're going to talk about what we think is bad, the stuff that we filtered out. And hopefully when we put it together, we'll see flows and trends. Executives are ready for our story. Here we go. Typical presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me back up a step. What I'm going to be showing you here is how to build stories. Okay, so it's not um, any particular number, but it's how we think. It's the rationale behind what we're presenting. So um, in, in the number game, piece by piece, uh, as I walk through, think about how you build it out. Your numbers, your metrics, if you've got one you've been struggling with, start thinking about it and think about how you build it. Okay, here we go. Here's my spam presentation. Inbound spam. Okay, several problems with this. Um, I'll start with how much mail came in and out of the company? No clue. I'm just telling you how much spam. Okay, I was smart enough to put on the slide a legend that says these are spam blocks. Okay, so this isn't the spam that made it in. This is the spam that didn't make it in. Okay, great, but what am I supposed to do with this? Not very helpful. Let's fix that. Oh, okay. So inbound email traffic. So here's all the traffic. I've got delivered mail, and I've got spam blocks, and I can kind of see, looks like maybe email's a little bit up in October. We could ask why that is. If in retail, maybe that's, uh, you know, we're getting a sales season, or, or who knows, but it's good. It's got a trend. We could talk about it. Um, learn a few things here. Looks like about half of my mail is spam that you're blocking. Okay. And if I'm getting a few spams a week as an executive, but you're saying half the email that comes in is being blocked to spam, then, okay, I get lots of messages every week, and I'm only getting a couple of spam, and you say half, well, you're doing a pretty good job. Okay, great, thank you. A couple other suggestions, though, before you put this slide out there, is, um, is green the color you want for spam? So here's something that we lose track of. We just throw this chart together. It's all auto-colored for us, and we're happy. Let's think about everything in the communication. So spam shouldn't be green. Let's pick another color. Purple, delivered, maybe that's good. I mean, maybe delivered's probably green. So here's another way of doing the same chart. The color is now appropriate. Green, good, delivered. Um, we didn't actually deliver spam, so maybe we want to do a dashed line around it to represent the total flow is this. You wonder why we have to have such big servers? Well, because we have to process twice the volume of what we're actually using. Oh, okay, I get that. And um, the nice thing is, and this gets hard, you can't always accomplish this, but if I were to print this out in monochrome, can you still read it? You can, because when it prints out in black and white, the dashed line will be you know, darker, harder. You'll see it. This chart will still work. Just because you gave it to them in a color PowerPoint doesn't mean ultimately that's what it's going to end up in their hands. So do think about some of those other potential factors. Also, since many executives have to do that, the color blindness is the attribute. Yes. Choosing colors is a very critical topic. There's multiple types of color blindness, by the way. There's red-green, there's um, yellow-purple, and then there's another that's fairly small. I forget what that other combination is. But, yeah, not so easy to do this, right? It just throw colors up there. No, it's, it's really actually a little more complex. So if you want to um, get really subtle and thoughtful about this, you can go quite a ways into the color. This would work for a colorblind person because yellow-green is not a colorblind combination. Uh, there are certain types of color blindness that knock out just about all ranges of color. A very thin line of, of that um, it, with people. But this would cover just about all cases in that. So 
it seems like a nuance, unless it turns out that one of the people on your board of directors is colorblind. And, and, and so, so if you can dodge that, you know, deal with it. Think about your audience. This is the recurring theme here. Okay, let's move on to something a little bit harder, vulnerabilities. Because um, if you've ever tried to explain vulnerabilities at an executive level, it's just not easy. So the security team is looking out at the business, and all you see is an unpatched mess. And you would just like them to get that stuff fixed. And why won't you fix your junk? And look how bad it is. The server administrators that you're trying to deal with just see patching as a huge time waster. You're killing me with patches. I don't even see what good they did. I haven't had any problems yet. And I've got other stuff that the business is demanding. Do we really need to patch all this stuff? I mean, really. And management, honestly, what they're trying to do is stand back. They don't want to have the philosophical debate about patch and don't patch and all those things. They just want to figure out risk, level of effort. What's my investment? How do I balance off the time I'm going to take away from doing something else for the time doing this? It's a risk management exercise. We often forget that everything we do is a risk management exercise. Just to open the doors of a business and, and start selling whatever you're selling means you've got risk. Things can go wrong. So we're not going to eliminate all vulnerabilities. We're not going to eliminate all risk. And, and someone's going to weigh that, and it's going to be management. So please don't end up off in the gutter somewhere trying to struggle through this. Let's figure out an approach. So now our goal that we're going to go after is how to explain vulnerabilities and drive some action on that. There is um, a need to turn it from a bad thing, you're unpatched, you're vulnerable, to a positive thing. So the spin that I've taken uh, in several of these efforts is to show patching success. Now I'm getting on the same side of the equation as the, uh, the sysadmins. We're on the same team. We're both trying to get to success. They may not have believed that on the front end of it, but you know, at least try to sell them on it a little bit. So it's going to be two things that are, are difficult to prove out why you'd want to do it. One of them is patching, because it seems like a time waster, because next month they're going to come back with more patches for me. So do I have to do it every month? Do I have to do it every time patches come out? Uh, I'll do it once a year. How's that? We all good? And configuration. Because if I'm a sysadmin, if I'm a DBA, I will configure for faster. Um, configuring for security is going to just slow me down what I want to do, and I don't know if that really helps the business. So we're going to have to convince on these elements. The pushback is going to have to be solved by pointing our metrics towards success, not failure. Because people will want to argue that one machine or that one patch isn't that big of a deal, we've got to rise above the discrete data points. But we have to be ready to enable a drill down. Because when you put up the chart and someone up above the management turns to whoever's going to have to do the patching and says, why isn't this dealt with, immediately the sysadmin is going to go into defense mode. So we have to make sure that we're not only trying to be supportive and positive in the metrics we put out, but we had better be ready to drill down and drill all the way down into the weeds. We're not going to show the weeds to the executives, but we're ready to pull it out if we have to. So if you're not really knowing your metrics, if you're not really solid on this, you better be get comfortable before you walk up in front of anybody else. Because once they prove you didn't know what you're talking about, you won't get a second chance in front of the executives. We know you have no credibility. Okay, let's try to solve this problem. This is one that I've done a couple of different companies. Um, it's successful over the long haul. Not saying this is the only way to do it, but here's my offering to you. Server grading. When we measure vulnerabilities, we will score them high, critical, medium, low. We will, we will score them with CVSS scores. They're all great. Um, you get a risk score for each item that you find, and then you add them up, and I present to my leadership 
we have 57,000 points of vulnerability. What am I supposed to do with that? It doesn't tell me anything. It's, it's, and it's a huge number. So I'm probably just going to go, OK, thanks for telling me, and walk off on you. Not where we want to be. Instead, what I have found very impactful will drive a lot of conversations. I'm going to grade the servers. All of us, if, if you're a parent, you know what it's like. All of us have most likely been through school, and we understand the concepts of grades. Perhaps we've had a few painful incursions with grades. We're, they're an emotional thing. They communicate very strongly. I like this. So because they're well understood, because they have emotional content, if you don't believe me, come home with an F. That's not going to go well. Um, the other nice thing is a grade is fairly discreet. The typical scale's got five of them. We get it. You can count how many A's or B's are on a report card and group them up. Oh, you got three B's and an A and two F's this semester. Well, that was better than last time. Um, and the nice thing is, when we grade stuff and then count them and group them up, we can still represent a server in a fairly understandable form. That server got an F. That server is a B. Okay, so it gives us the ability to aggregate and disaggregate very easily. And they're going to ask, show me the low performers. This is what happens when you do something like this. So to do it, here's my approach. We go out, we get system scanning. Put in your tool of choice. I'm agnostic about it. Um, I've used a few different ones. You're going to get back probably missing patches and other vulnerabilities by severity per system. Whatever your grading scale is, you're probably going to spit out something like that. We're going to run it through a process. We're going to standardize and we're going to score stuff. So we're going to set some thresholds about um, what we are and are not going to include in the scoring algorithm. We're going to take out du duplication. Now this is very important to catch. If you have a large environment, you most likely have at least some devices, some hosts that are multi-homed. That is, they have multiple IP addresses. And if your scanners are scanning and presenting back data by IP address, then big, huge server will show up five times because it's got five interfaces on it. You'll need to deduplicate it and only take the scoring off of one of those interfaces to represent one server. This is a step that if you miss, trust me, the server admins will eat you up on it. So we have to deduplicate, and then we have to score. And then at the end of it, we're going to have to summarize. So we have to compute some grades, and we have to present. Let's walk through. Here's my first server. Here's my approach. I've got uh, a high, a medium, and two lows from the results of my scan. OK, great. Uh, I've decided that my scaling is going to be for every critical. I'm going to take 20 points off. This is like grading a paper, right? The teacher sits down, pulls up your thing, and says, OK. Huh, good, good. Oh, minus 2. Uh, uh, OK, minus 5. Adds it up. There you go. Here's your score. So we've done that in this process. We multiplied out um, the scale value, 20 for critical, et cetera. And then we go through, and the last column is, now I'm scoring. I start with 100 points at the top of my paper, and I start subtracting. Yes? So what we're going to do is we're going to be the teacher that says, at some point, we're just going to call it a zero and move on. No, it's a fantastic question, and I do that today. I, I've written the algorithm. This is not hard to do. It's a fairly straightforward algorithm. One thing that I don't have represented here is I've also set limits uh, in my scoring mechanism. And so, for example, on lows, I won't take off more than 20 points worth of lows. So you could have a 1,000 lows on a server, and if everything else is clean on the higher level vulnerabilities, you're going to come up with an 80. Why? Because try to have that argument about a thousand lows that really aren't terribly exploitable, they're just misconfig, sloppy, and try to convince me that a server that's got zero criticals, zero mediums, and zero highs deserves a zero. So instead, what I do is not only do I have the scale, but I also have caps on my mediums and lows. 20 points worth of mediums, 20 points worth of lows, and I stop taking points off for those categories. And I stop at zero. Yes? 
grade for your other yes. Grade, but they also work in the other direction where they will cap your grade if certain types of vulnerabilities are present. So yeah, so they'll say if you if you had heart bleed, you can't get any better than I don't know C or whatever. C, yeah. yeah, and so so I'm going to offer. I, and I think this is this is sort of conversation when you sit down to do this. This particular scoring mechanism that I used, you're welcome to roll your own a little bit. Um, this is a model to start thinking about. Okay. B, that seems pretty fair for the server. How about this server? <coughs> it's got a critical, it's got a high. A few other things, you failed. You probably don't like that you failed. It's got a critical on it. It's got a high, and a few other things. It, it's bad. OK, so now we go through. We have hundreds of servers. We, we convert them to letter scores, and we're going to present them. It's going to look something like this. So let me explain what this chart shows and, and talk through uh, some features of it. I, as the executive, have just had this put in front of me. It's perhaps been explained before to me, or I'm going to lean over to the other executive next to him and next to me and explain. Oh, okay, here's what it is. So from November through November, here's a 13-month rolling chart. It's trend-based. I get that. I'm a leader of a company. We've had a very slight growth in servers. Not a surprise. We've added a few servers over the months. Hmm. Looks like over time, a year ago. About half our servers were Ds or Fs. We weren't real excited back then when we got that report. So we started working on it. And so we've been driving this wedge. And you can see this wedge very clearly. Now, not all of our machines are As. And as an executive, depending on what I set as the target for the CIO, this might be awesome. And I might say, how about in the next quarter, I see from October to November of this year, uh, just very recently, you had the Ds almost completely mashed, and something slipped. What happened in your process? Now, what's really interesting, we're not talking about why the security guys are jerks, are we? We're asking the CIO what happened in your process that was trending very nicely, and now you've backslidden. What was I trying to achieve? I'm trying to eliminate vulnerabilities this chart will drive that because after they start improving, now tell me that you can't fix it because clearly you can. Also, this is color coded appropriately. Now, we may run into some problems with color blindness. We get a certain number of colors in the chart. It's going to be problematic, perhaps. I'll grant you that. But here, A's are wonderfully green. B's and C's are probably OK machines. They're nice color blue. D's and F's not so much. Would you feel comfortable putting this in front of your executives? I think this is the way that we can communicate. Now, there's probably some improvements to make to this, but they'll get this. And if, if the color trends are going the wrong direction, oh, they'll get that too. And they'll help you. So you're making it happen. Okay, there are a lot of stories to tell with metrics. I use that one because I think it's one of the hard ones to crack, because I think that's a pretty good solution for it. And, um, and it's got some layers of complexity, and so we can talk through how do you build layers of information into that real simple chart. What you have to do is you have to look at all your metrics, and you have to look at your environment, and ask yourself what needs to change or improve. What are the things you want to fix? It may or may not be the things you're collecting numbers for today. Go out and start figuring out what numbers can you collect that represent that. I'm going to warn you, make sure that whatever you're going to present, that you can collect that number fairly accurately. It's got to be factual. And that you can collect it consistently at a pace that you can report with. Because if your numbers aren't real stable in terms of what they represent, if it's an interpretive dance, it's not going to work. These are metrics. They're facts. So when people get upset about them, we're just going to say, hey, not a problem. Let's drill down. 
And at some point, as you keep drilling down and they keep getting more facts, they're going to say, okay, we'll do something about it. So we gather these numbers up and then think about how to take these numbers and represent them as trends. Think about visual representation. Play with it. I've shown you bar charts. It doesn't have to be bar charts. It could be pie charts, although trending with pie charts can be tricky. I have done that. You show three or four pie charts next to each other, and they can see the little wedges turn. Okay, you can do that. You can represent a trend with pie charts, but it's a little harder. You can use bubble charts. Go talk to someone who's in statistics. They've probably got a million great ways to represent numbers. But think about it visually and think about trends and relationships so, because that's what's going to be asked from the leadership to you is what does this mean? Where should it be going? How do we change the direction of that? Or how do we push it harder the direction it's going? Okay? Then, as you do that, you need to make sure you talk across your team. This is hard. We're moving out of our comfort space into um, kind of some abstractions. So you want to help your people that will help you gather these numbers, and you want the other people who will be impacted, like those sysadmins and DBAs that have to go fix stuff, to understand what you're doing. And you want them to understand that your gathering of metrics and your presentation is doing things that help the company. You're trying to drive efficiency. Trust me, there are some sysadmins out there, especially the Unix ones, that are probably really big on efficiency. And anything that's glitchy that doesn't run right in a script, they will pound into the ground because it's not efficient. And they're really smart people. If you can get them on board with this, they will drive your security like, like you won't be able to catch up to them. And they'll like your numbers because what will happen is once they see what's going on and they realize if I do this, I can move his numbers, they will drive your numbers to perfection just to prove they can. So, so talk to other people. Help them to embrace it. Talk to managers about cost control, right? If we, if we have less outages because we've done some better security. And make sure anybody who's helping you gather the numbers understands that management never listens to us is not the attitude. We will control the board by giving them numbers to influence them. If we give it to them in the right way, they'll drive it. They want to do that. Right? They hired us smart people to do smart stuff for the company. If we can show them we can do it, they're going to step back out of the way, give us some resources, and say, go do it. Okay? So this is our motivation, and we have to help the people around us get this idea. Okay. One more story about a number. A little bit less obvious, but there's a lot of these out there, and, and you probably have some. Antivirus failed to clean on laptops. We're not debating whether antivirus is good or bad, another religious debate, but if you have AV installed on a machine and something lands on the machine and it cleans it, that's a win. And if it doesn't and we have to go take the machine and re-image it, that's costly. It means somebody is, doesn't have their machine for a period of time. We're, we're, we're impacting the company in a lot of different ways just because someone had to reimage one machine. It's, you start thinking about the consequences of a machine that's down. So reimages are bad. They're red on this chart. Notice the scale. Now, when you're playing with scales, make sure you're not trying to deceive. We're trying to just focus on it. We would like automated resolution of a virus infection coming in to be in the 99 something or other. That's our goal. We may have to go a little further down. You see this starting to develop, and, and leadership will go, hmm, walking through this, we had a few things. OK, you know, viruses come. The AV doesn't hit everything. But look at the trend developing on here. What do you think happened about the time the September chart was produced? New malware, or maybe, because we're seeing these drops and these drops, Maybe what's happening is leadership says, I don't know what's going on, but something's not effective. Our trend, see the, the red going bigger and bigger? Our trend's going the wrong direction. Get rid of the red. 
whatever needed to be done, and I can tell you in this case, part of what it was, was the desktop team like, eh, I'll just run the malware self-cleanup again, and it'll be fine. If it didn't catch it the first time, and I see you beaconing out to trying to get to the outside world, being blocked by my firewalls to phone home to a command and control server, and I told you, re-image that machine, nah, I'm smarter than you. I'm not going to re-image. We'll just run the antivirus again that didn't work the first time. And now it spreads? No. So we knew what was going on. We talked and said, well, here's the problem. They're not wiping machines. Why not? Well, it takes time. Wipe the machines. October. Problem solved. By the way, next time the desktop team has, you know, hey, we found five machines in this little outbreak. Could you please go grab those machines and clean them up right away? Oh my gosh, it's like watching one of those old-timey movies with a Keystone cop stumbling over each other to grab the laptops and clean them. It's not because they enjoy re-imaging machines. It's because this chart drove a communication from the very top of the organization down. Fix it. It's an effective metric. So, um, those are all the charts I have. I hope I've, I've introduced some ideas. I'd love to talk with you about metrics that you think have been really successful in presentation or, or something you're struggling with. We've got this brain trust in the room right now to, to talk through and maybe solve the problem you're dealing with. Um, also invite conversation on Twitter if you'd like. Uh, I really would like to encourage the idea, getting out there, let's feed our executives numbers, not numbers. Uh, I want us as a security community to be more effective, and I want the business to understand the value we bring. And we're, we're only going to do that as we're talking their language. Here's one piece of it, I think. So with that, um, questions, comments, floor is open. Yes, you must. You must first take a twos and pet. No, so right. So we have to be again very thoughtful about what we're going to bring forth. Um, if your environment has all environments have some sort of mitigations around them, so you may start with a vuln scanner that's on the internet and outside in and start with that cleanup, and also measure the inside full knowledge sort of scanner. And that second set of charts, you may just gather data and start building your trend and only present the outside-in look initially. I'd strongly suggest you never present a chart until you've had at least three months' worth of data, if it's on a monthly chart. One, because the second month you scan, you're going to discover something about your data you didn't realize, and you have to reformat and recast the data. By the third or fourth month, you've probably stabilized it, and you know what it's representing. It also gives you several months to start talking with the other teams about something that's coming. And when they have several months advance notice that this is going to be reaching upper levels of the organization, they can ask a lot of questions about it. You can have some aha moments yourself where you realize there's some problems. Um, to go back to the grading example, uh, I talked about capping certain deductions. I also have an exception mechanism to do exceptions for certain vulnerabilities where I can code that in there and take that out of the scoring. So yes, we know this patch we're not going to deploy because of this particular reason. So we make sure that that patch gets extracted out of the scoring from everywhere. We also have certain machines that they've decided, for better or for worse, are not going to be graded right now. OK, so I've got an exception list for machines that aren't going to be graded, and they come out of the scores. Um, that comes from conversations with those affected. If you've had those conversations over a couple of months, and then as you've kind of tuned your set of information, when you bring that forth, yes, someone's going to protest and says, well, you know, 
who knows about this? Well, we've been talking with the uh, DBA team for the last three months, and you'll notice already that, that they made some adjustments. Kills the argument very quickly. Um, you want people on your side. It's, it's not a battle. We're actually more of kind of a consensus and coordinator in security. We work with everybody, and you want to spin it positively. So if it's a mess, at least it's a mess headed in the right direction by the time leadership sees it. And they know they're going to have to work at it. But at least you've talked about it. So yeah, don't don't pop this on anybody. Don't surprise people with your metrics. Good point. Check. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just to recap, just because we're recording this, perhaps someone else will watch it at some point. The the point about you know, things that are more vulnerable, how you score it, um, the ability to, to know the, the, the way something is scored. Um, again, to, to pull another layer on this, I actually have two versions of our internal vulnerability charts. One of them is raw, here are all the vulnerabilities with the scoring that I just showed you. I have another version where I say, uh, but exploitable equals yes. So known, you know, out there on the street, available exploit, not super secret zero day, and when I recast those charts, here's the fun part, because people say, but is it exploitable? Okay, exploitable equals no. Oh, look, the charts looks really similar. It's only moved a little bit. Well, yeah, but you've got mediums in there. I do. Let me take the mediums out. Oh, <laughs> it didn't move that much. You want me to take the highs out too? Don't worry, I've already looked at the data. Be happy to take the highs out. How about we only tell the people, the executives, what your servers look like with only exploitable criticals? You want me to play that game? And so if you've really looked at your data, you'll start to see exactly what Jack's describing, which is um, you may have to tune it a little bit. Uh, you may want to take some data out there. Your story probably uh, won't change that dramatically. You'll still have some, uh, some things to go do. Yes? Mm. And we try to approach it as, okay, we can't fix it, so we're seeing this trend. What can we do to help you get the resources you need to get it fixed? So that way, neither one of us is having an uncomfortable conversation with the public. Yes. Let me tell the story so that you can get the resources you need to go do this. Um, that's a very important part of it. Uh, this is something we have in the community and, and had discussions when we were putting this B-sides together about, you know, are you red or are you blue? And, and part of the, the remark about the keynote and, and uh, the lunch is that was our, peop our purple track, right? Because we're all in this together. We, we want success. If there's another group that has to do the fix and the reason they can't do it is they don't have enough resources, part of the approach to them is not look how bad you are, but is, look, I've got this information. I can bring this forward to the leadership 
can you help figure out what all you need, or can I work with you to figure out what you need to correct it, so when I step up and say, here's what it is, you're going to be in that room, your boss is going to be in that room, and they already know, and the strategy is, we're driving to fund you for your fix to correct this chart. Okay? It's, it's not a zero-sum game in security. We, we, we raise all the boats with the tide if we do it right. So, um, yeah, a, a competing organization may not be competing. I used to have this go on with, with an IT when internal audit came around. So there's, there's one group that maybe hated slightly more than InfoSec, internal audit. And um, the deal I would make with some of the people in IT is, look, here's the requirements, here's the standard I'm expecting to meet. If, if you set your systems up this way, and then internal audit dings you for that configuration, you just send them to me. And they thought about it. I don't have to deal with internal audit? OK. Deal. I'll configure it that way. I win. <laughs> so so the, the conversation of engaging the other people and figuring out, I'm going to present this so that you can get resource is a very valid use of metrics. It benefits the business. And that's where we're at. We're doing everything we do, hopefully, aiming for the betterment of the organization. Otherwise, why do they need us? Any particular metrics uh, someone like to throw out there is the unsolvable, how do I present this? Or, or has this given you some ideas now about what to do with what you've got? I have not had time to, to get into that um, very much. I've presented metrics off of what's coming off the IDSs. So I'll present, um, I do have a metric that takes the events detected by the antivirus off of all the workstations and servers, and the events detected by IDS, and the events that are uh, detected blocks on firewalls going outbound, and uh, made bar charts like that that help look at trends of what you can kind of see overall the rise and fall of events, and you can get a sense of what layers are doing. Like are some layers, you know, one layer has gone down in terms of the amount of blocks it's seeing, and then suddenly you see your outbound firewalls are defending a lot of attempts to reach back out for command and control, and you're like, what's failing in AV? Because that dropped at the same time our instances jumped up on the firewall. You start thinking about relationships between different pieces, but I haven't done a whole lot just specifically around IDS. Um, I have seen some lists of all sorts of real interesting metrics you can gather that are, are related to that sort of stuff. I'm curious if there are like published, public, or public domain type resources that are worth leaning on or you know, like state of the internet type stuff that makes sense to factor into this conversation. I operate at a really small scale, so we don't have meaningful metrics. Um, I don't know. Is anybody aware of uh, seen metrics that give you a comparative basis? Comparative, stuff like that, but vulnerability levels. In terms of vulnerabilities, exploitability, things like that. Mm, I'm not familiar with with companies publishing that sort of data. I know they get... So you can look at the scoring. Yes. And, and, and a lot of your, your tools will, um, when they give you a rating, they'll not, not only give you critical, medium, and high, but a lot of them will also give you several versions of that. So you'll get the CVS total score, you know, 0 to 10. You'll also get the subcomponents of it. You may get, um, like on Microsoft patches, you may say, oh, this is a missing patch. Microsoft calls it an important, but we call it a critical because. Um, and then what you have to do is, is figure out which of those frameworks you want to base your program off of. Um, because someone will ask, you called it critical, but Microsoft only called it this. Well, yes, we called it critical because in our company, these factors. I don't do any adjustments to that. Um, I actually am not currently using that. We've talked about it. 
Um, we do have some metrics that score total uh, vulnerability, the big bad number that I talked about. We do have a chart like that because some people actually want to see that chart, and that's based on the CVS scores, CVSS scores. But um, the rest of mine are actually rated on you know, critical, high, medium, low, as I kind of showed you my scoring algorithm. Um, it's arguable that, that my grading is less precise, but it still works for what we're trying to accomplish with it. <clears throat> the grading scale, well, so the grading scale is, you know, ABC equals this, and that I scoring mean, is driven, yeah, critical, high, medium, low. We are actually using uh, a commercial product that has categorized each of the vulnerabilities and placed it in one of the slots. And, and, and the way they do it does look at things like the CVSS scores. Um, we don't have, my team's too small, so we don't have the time to sit there and second guess them. They're a pretty smart company. So I'm going to go with, with their rating of, of the um, vulnerabilities that they find. Uh, you can do it yourself. I've worked at a company before that would take patches, and they would evaluate themselves and self-rate what they were, and then with concurrence from the server teams. Um, that's another way if you've got the resource to do it. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a smart move. Uh, I think you're going to see more of the app development houses because now there's more and more attention about uh, the vulnerabilities that applications present. So if it's outsourced development that I'm doing, maybe one of the grades I should have in my contracts or how I pay you should be related to the quality of your code from a security perspective too. I think the smart app houses will start figuring out how they want that conversation to be managed, as opposed to having it handed to them. So you're ahead of the curve, I think, on that. Yes? mandates awareness. So the first metric is your, if you have annual training, what's your actual level of compliance to that training? You know, are you at 86% of your people are trained? Are you at 96%? Um, but that only begins to do it. Um, a lot of organizations will also go in and do uh, like phishing testing programs, and then you can get scoring or metrics off of that. Um, and then um, you could try surveying and see what the responses to surveys are. Uh, how you get the metrics on awareness is a little bit tricky. Uh, but then what you do is combine that. So if I did an awareness program and then I did a, a phishing uh, education testing program and I compared that to my machines getting infected, which I might use the number of machines that suddenly start strobing out to a command and control server. Looks like you got something on you. And if I can put those numbers next to each other and see if they flow together, I might see a relationship uh, that would give me an idea. How is my program, as I raise the number of people that are taking the tests, as I lower the number of people that fail the phishing testing, is my infection rate going down? The thing you have to be very careful when you start putting these together, and I'm not a statistician, make sure you don't confuse relationship with causal uh, correlation. Yeah, it may not be causal. Sometimes, though, that's as close as you can get, and it's, it's, it's supportive of the general idea. Um, you may want to talk to companies that do uh, phishing 
programs and ask them what metrics they have found are useful in selling their programs. Uh, that's a good place to start, I think. And then compare that to actual infection rates. And if you can tie the machines to the people who were or were not trained, that's another interesting data point. Make sure whatever you start collecting, though, you can collect consistently so that you can present it month over month, quarter over quarter. If you can't collect the information consistently, you can't build a trend, and then it's just one month, so what? Yes? Yes. Yeah, if, you, if you've got a ticketing system that your IT uses and your help desk uses, go in there and see what you can pull out of it. Um, one thing that we do use is a metric. It's a little soft, I'll admit it, but um, we have a metric that shows um, part of that thing I, I said where the machine cleaned itself, that red portion. Part of that is the ones we see hitting, trying to go out to hit command and control servers, but we also add into that any tickets that we saw during the month where a user called in and said, I think I'm infected, and then the team went after it. Um, so there are some other numbers you can, you can add in there to do. Yes? Do you get any more granular with that by having the multiple controller information about those log metrics and that? You can try to get more granular. If you can successfully get the people who enter the data in there to get more granular, Awesome. If you can make it really easy to get more granular data, awesome. But if you can't, then you have to be careful not to get more granular than you actually have facts to support. Yes. Tracking tracking the actual dollar cost of rework because of security flaws, real dollar spent is a very powerful metric. So um, thank you, and and that's probably a great way to end it, right? At some point, everything that we're doing is is can be boiled down to dollars and cents. Our no, our metrics may not be cast in that way, but that's what they represent. We're trying to influence when we talk to our top leaders about changing something to make the business better and save dollars and cents uh, on security or invest dollars and cents on it. And so I think if you keep that business thought in mind, if you realize that we have to raise the discussion to a level that drives action and is understandable to them, uh, use a few of these techniques or tricks or ideas. Um, I think you'll have more impact. And I, again, I invite, uh, there's my Twitter handle. Um, love conversation about things that worked or, or questions. Let's all get smarter about this and, and manage up, uh, drive the th results that we want to see in the company. Thank you very much.